Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Black Doctoral Network, I welcome you all to the very first workshop of the Fall 2021 series. I am Dr. Nieta Scott Dunmore, a proud member of this prestigious organization. We invite you all to please consider becoming a member at any time. This evening, I have the distinct pleasure of being your moderator. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. I've already put the workshop form evaluation in the chat. So please, please complete that before the workshop is over. And um, if you have to leave early, still please complete it so we'll know how we're doing because we want to do what's best for all of us and especially for you so we can bring different workshops to you. Next is that I will be monitoring the chat throughout the entire evening. So please put questions as well as anything that you would like either one of the presenters uh, to answer or to further discuss. Tonight is Tuesday, September the 14th, and our workshop series title is Beyond Academia, Leveraging Your Doctoral Degree for Maximum Impact. When I think of the two doctors that are here, the prestigious doctors that we have, Dr. Tony Harrison Kelly and Dr. Charlotte Horton Williams, I think of these duos, these dynamic duos, Barnes and Nobles, Batman and Robin, Ice Cream and Cake, yes. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Bacon and Eggs, Strawberries and Cream, Oprah and Gail. A little bit about our first presenter is Dr. who is Dr. Charlotte Horton Williams. She has a Bachelor of Social Work. The field of study is social work and psychology from the University of North Texas. Her master's degree, her master's in education is from Lamar University. And her doctorate is from Texas A&M University in the field of curriculum and instruction. And as you've all looked to see what this workshop was all about, it's talking about the importance of finishing that terminal degree that we all have crossed that path and bridge into. So without further ado, because I do not want to just duplicate what they're gonna say about their background, I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Shorla Horton Williams, Dr. Williams. Hello everyone, so glad that you all are with us tonight. Um, I'm just gonna say that that was probably the best introduction I've ever had in my yes. entire life. And I'm from the black church, so I've had some great introductions <laughs> over the years. Yes. So, um, on the screen, you'll see some of the things that I love. My three children, my three nieces, Beyonce, Coffee, and dogs, particularly uh, my sweet lab, Dalton. Um, as she said, Tony and I um, are proud graduates of Texas A&M University, yes, and my doctoral research was, well, I'll tell you about that later. Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> a little bit about us and what we do. Um, Tony and I, about a year ago, launched um, a um, uh, educational DEI firm because we are passionate about um, two things, about education and about equity. And so we decided to take those two things, merge them together. And we're gonna talk a little bit about our postdoctoral journey and how SLSJ fits into that. But through SLSJ, we help schools and school districts launch, deepen and sustain their educational equity work. Um, we also started later um, a closely related but distinctly different um, service through Horton Kelly Company, where we also help businesses and churches and small and, um, organizations launch and deepen their DEI work, um, specifically through training and strategy development. And last but not least, we offer contracted services to schools and education adjacent organizations so that they can focus on their primary work and we offer um, contracted services like project management, interim leadership and things like that. So we are very deeply rooted in education um, and our number one goal in all the work that we do is to advance educational e uh, excellence and educational equity. 
Good afternoon. I am Dr. Tony Harrison Kelly. I am Charlotte's bestie of the last, oh, about 28 years. So all those children you saw on the screen call me Aunt Tony. And so we've been together for a long, long time. The things on the screen are the things that I am probably most passionate about right now. I love Jesus. Amen. I also am a proud teacher in Dallas ISD. So when I'm not fighting for equity, I am teaching eighth grade and I love it. Middle schoolers are my people. I also love roller skating. That's my new thing. And I liked roller skating before the new Bruno Mars song came out, I promise. But I, I'm, I'm out there every Thursday skating my little tail off. And I am also a brand new Star Wars convert. So Baby Yoda came out, I've been in love ever since. So that is me in a nutshell, just kind of a snapshot because that's a line to change, I'm telling you. So we've heard about us. But who's here? So roll call. So if you would, if you would just let us know who you are, what your job is, what your degree is, what your name is. We can see that on the screen. But anything you want to share about us, just type it in the chat. This would be our informal introductions, just so we can get a feel for who's here. So while you're sharing in the chat, I'll go ahead and tell you just kind of our objective for tonight while we're all here. So we're hoping to be able to discover some key truths about what you can do, which way you can go, just do some discovery, some reflection, taking the time out to just sit still and really think about who we are, what we want, and be able to kind of push past the boundaries, the known boundaries. So we all know about being able to go teach. What else can we do with um, our terminal degrees? So that's what we'll be discussing today. What you'll need, paper or a learning log. So Sharla, I believe we'll drop our learning log in the chat. The learning log is just a place for you to capture any thoughts aha moments. There will be activities that we walk through together. So any of that information can be captured on your learning log and Charlotte can drop that in. Or you can just work through it on paper and pen with paper and pen. So we'll put the questions on the screen, the things we're thinking about, reflection time, information on the screen. So you can just go that way as well. And please make sure that you have a very open mind because the goal is to discover new routes, new avenues. So that means that we have to be flexible and open as we learn more about each other. So um, in all of our work that we do with educators and all of our workshops, we talk about things like race, color, and culture. And for so many people, those conversations are hard. Um, they can be uncomfortable for people who are not used to engaging in conversations around race, color, and culture. So we use these four agreements from Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversations about race um, to help people navigate the conversations safely and meaningfully. And while we're not talking about race tonight, we still wanna use these four agreements to guide our time together. So number one, we ask that you stay engaged, let this time kind of be sacred. Um, we are not the experts, but we are gonna share our journey and we really want our journey um, and the, the prompts that we're gonna provide you with to inspire you to think, uh, like Tony said, differently about how you might, um, what next steps you might take um, post-doctoral, uh, post-doctorate, st doctoral studies, excuse me. Number two, experience discomfort. Number three, speak your truth. We're going to do a little bit of um, personal reflection and looking at personal identity. So think very carefully and openly and honestly and transparently about who you are, what you love, what matters most to you. And then last but not least, expect and accept non-closure. We are not going to leave here with business plans. We are not going to leave here uh, ready to go and uh, um, start an entirely new venture, but we are hopefully going to leave with some information and some inspiration to think um, very openly about all the ways that we can leverage our doctoral studies and research to impact society, impact our respective disciplines, and impact even um, just our local context. So 
so a little bit about us. Tony has already told you all that we have been best friends for almost 30 years. So we've done a lot of life <laughs> together. We did undergrad together at UNT. Um, we did go to grad school at the same time, but at different universities. Um, we bought homes. We've been married, not to each other. We've been married. We've been divorced. <laughs> we've had kids. We've started businesses. We've traveled the world. But I think one of the most significant things that we've done together was actually our doctoral studies. Um, it was during that long, arduous, very difficult, very refining process um, that we both as people, um, as scholars, as professionals, as practitioners, and even as friends um, discovered our passion, right? Mm -hmm. Both our individual and collective passion. Um, I think that, I honestly think that our four years of doctoral study was our, like, that was our watershed moment, um, both as, as a friend, as friends and as people. Um, and so it was in the months following graduation that we uh, essentially caught a our calling, right? And we established this business. So we started at UNT, we worked at a daycare together, which was for both of us, our first um, work in first work in education. Then we started a school together. We served, uh, we started a micro school. We served about 200 kids pre-K through third, pre-K pre through eighth grade for about 10 years. Then we went into respective um, traditional ISDs, I was a teacher turned assistant principal turned principal. Tony is still a teacher in Dallas ISD. Then we started at A&M together. Um, after we graduated, we started this Facebook group, right? So we figured out that like, okay, our doctoral research, things that we're passionate about, we're passionate about, and we think other people might be interested in it too. So we started this Facebook group really as a way to disseminate our research, to make it meaningful to people out there in the world who might have similar interests um, in, our, in the discipline of education. Um, our Facebook group grew to about 3,000 people. Then we started a 501c3, and then we started our LLC, um, and we do all of our our DEI work under that umbrella. Um, so you can see that we've had a long journey together um, that has started in education and ended in education. Um, and as we talk a little bit more tonight about these 10 questions to guide your next steps, we're going to share a little bit more about the details about our research and about how we got from the top of this bulleted list all the way down to the bottom. And our story isn't over. We are just beginning. And this is our quote that we use for every single training because we believe there's so much power in it. It says, the ability to imagine a world that is different than the present is the beginning of any movement for change. To be able to communicate the, one, the world one imagines to others and have it feel possible is the power of narrative. So tonight you'll hear our story because we have a short amount of time so we don't have time to share everyone's story but our perspective is that of the education world we have doctorates of education so that will be our focus that's our passion but as we're telling our story we challenge and invite you to think about your story how does your story align how does it differ what things are specific to your content your focus area that may be different from ours. So please customize this information as we go through. And the goal is for us to just come out of this with a clear vision of what we want and what we want our next chapter of our story to become. So we've talked a little bit about our story. And so now our goal is to take you through these 10 questions to be able to stop and think. Typically, grown folks don't have time, like an hour, to just think about who you are and what you want. And so this is a special time, and I'm hoping that we all just lean into it. So the first question, this is on your learning log. If you've downloaded it, the link was placed in the chat, I believe. If not, you can always just use your own notes, take your own notes. But the first question is, what is your research topic or focus. Um, mine was using gamification to increase student engagement for African American middle school students from low SES households. Yes, a mouthful, and I'm sure every one of your titles are similarly complex. Um, basically, I wanted to see if I used gamification, could I help 
the black students that I serve engaged more with my content. And my research topic, um, research focus was on the role of school leaders in closing the achievement gap. What are the specific, uh, what is the specific knowledge, skills, and dispositions required to be an effective social justice school leader? So that's what Tony and I focused, uh, that was Tony and I's focus on um, our doctoral research. Now think about yours. If you're using your learning log, there's a place for you to answer the questions as we're going through them on your learning log. Please trust that this is, oh, the link isn't working. I'll, I'll pop it in there again. Um, it will prompt you to make a copy, uh, Rogers. Okay, so if it says once it comes up, it looks like it's an error, but you're just, if you click make a copy, it should tell, it should give you the option to create a new one, but I will pop it back in the chat again. So think about what is yours um, and just in, very briefly summarize that in your learning log. And if you're a student, what do you think it's gonna be? What's your passion right now? Okay, I popped the link to the learning log back in there. So see if it's working this time. And if not, we'll try a different route. Okay, so you've got your first question. What's your research topic? Our second question is, who does your research matter the most to? And don't just think about um, who's gonna read it, but think about the product of your work. What industries would this matter most to? Which companies might this matter most to? What people might this matter most to and why? So my answer is definitely the education realm, but mostly teachers who are in tough schools, especially if there's a cultural mismatch. So especially if you are one race or culture and you're teaching students of another. So that was the focus of my research. And I think those are the people who would be most impacted. And um, from my research, um, the people who this research would matter most to, my work would matter most to, would be principals and district leaders who have disproportionately lower academic and non-academic outcomes for Black and Hispanic students um, than for white and Asian students. Those who have a clear disproportionality present um, that they recognize a need to address. So now what about you? Think about your area of study, your topic of research, like who would this matter to at the end of the day? Okay, I'm gonna work on this learning log again. And then Tony, you can go on to question three while I'm working on this. I don't know why it's not working. No worries. So question three, summarize how your research benefits others in two to three bullet points. This was really a hard question for me. I had to stop and ponder very deeply about, so how does it benefit others? So my three bullets, I think it basically reminds teachers that African-American students have a unique culture and have unique needs, which is um, sometimes a different thought process because most of the teachers just kind of see black kids as blending in as being homogenous and not having a defined culture. So my research gets to re remind them that that's there. Um, I actually, during my research, discovered that my gamification system helps students feel closer to each other. So maybe there's a, a, some more information there that can be found about how to increase peer connections with African-American teens. 
which is is a, a, an area of need. Um, so that's that's probably two bullets. And lastly, I'm hoping to bring joy back to the classroom. We have a training called Make School Magical Again. And I think a big part of that is play. And even at the middle school, secondary levels, there needs to be joy. So joy, helping students make friendships. And I think the reminding teachers that there is a special culture that comes with serving children who are African-American. Okay, and how does my research benefit others in two to three bullet points? I have two bullet points. Number one, inequity in schools is real, and we all have a responsibility in achieving racial equity in society, particularly in education. The second bullet that I would share, um, I think when principals initiate and lead the work of educational equity in their schools, they can change outcomes. And I think we think mm -hmm. so much about equity in terms of what's happening in the classroom, but there's a larger context and there's a larger, um, a larger lens through which we have to look at educational equity. So um, it's real and we can fix it. So those are my two bullet points in a, in a nutshell. Our fourth question is, think about this. What would happen if your research findings were utilized widely? You know, y'all, we have lots of friends who have, are either in or have completed doctoral studies and get the, the um, dissertation bound beautifully. Did everybody get their dissertation bound and got your book with your title down the side? And for so many people, that work just sits on a shelf. I want you to think about what would happen if, if we actually, if this was distributed widely and not just distributed widely, but if the findings, if the, 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 the fruit of your work was actually utilized widely. Um, for me, I think if we really focused on educational excellence and educational equity, and if we invested in it um, in a, at a rate that matched our passion and that matched the problem, um, we could radically change academic and non-academic outcomes for Black and Hispanic students in schools all across the country. If we actually utilized the research that we've done mm -hmm. on um, closing the opportunity achievement gap. So take a second to think about what would happen if your research findings were utilized And the last question, what might happen if your research findings are not utilized, are not utilized? So the first thing that came to mind is both Charlotte and I really focused on different routes to closing the achievement gap. So if we don't say anything, if we don't get out there and make some waves and get this information to people, then that's two less tools that people have towards equity and towards achieving equity. So yes, there's a risk in us going out there and trying to impact the world, essentially. But what happens if we don't? If we don't, then we are, first of all, not being honest to ourselves. We did all this work. It's our passion. And then we are also depriving the world of a possible solution. And we're excited about getting out there, even though it's scary. So think about your research. What might happen if your research findings are not utilized, if, if no one ever knows about the things that you discovered during your research time? So we talked about having 10 questions. That was the first five. And so as we were going through those, the goal was to help highlight the value of what you discovered. So help make it very clear that what you studied was valuable. It could be helpful to people. There are people who need this information, which then creates this sense of urgency that we've got to get it out there somehow. And now the big question 
is what route do we take? What road do we take? If we're not going to go stand in the classroom or create a class for a university, what can we do to have an impact on our specific and particular realm? So the first thing we need to do is have a little bit of a therapy session. Don't, don't be afraid. It's only between you and yourself, you know, so discovering and thinking about who are you and who we are. What does that mean for how we show up in the world and what do we want to do? So at this point, we're going to just discuss the first question of who are you? So in one of our sessions that we do, one of our series called Inside Out, we do this deep personal examination of who we are as people and how that informs and impacts the work that we do as educators. Um, and so this is a modification and it's adapted from the circles of identity or Paseo, um, if you're familiar with that work, some work out of UCLA. So we're gonna think about this in terms of not necessarily our racial or cultural identity, which is the way we do it with um, in the other sessions, but really in terms of our personalities, in terms of the way we work, in terms of how we identify professionally. So number one, I love a stage. Um, I'm not shy at all. Number two, I identify as a leader. Number three, I'm task oriented over people oriented. Uh, typically. Number four, while I do love a stage, I am an introvert and large crowds of people and, and expending lots of energy um, on and with people and group work, things like that really drain me. And number five, I think one, two, three, four, five. And number five, I'm a creator. I'm very much a visionary. I'm very much an idealist. I'm very much a creator. I'm always coming up with what is the next thing we can do, create, be, or um what can we make? That's all facts. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so I too am an intro introvert. Charlotte, if it's a scale of one to 10 for introversion, one being a hermit, 10 being, you know, Oprah Winfrey or whatever, I am definitely closer to the one. So I would spend every weekend reading books if it were up to me. I am also very adventurous, which kind of competes with my introversion. I like to try new things constantly. So every time we do this presentation or do any presentations, my little slideshow keeps changing about what I'm interested in. I'm always doing something new. I'm very relational, all about people. I'm a motivator. So I, I think I, I, I'm a coach at heart. I love to push and help and support people. And then I'm a connector. So I like to connect random ideas to create something new. I like to find synergy between people and organizations. So those are the things that, that are kind of central to who I am. And now you get a chance to think about yourself. So we're gonna be quiet for just a few seconds. So you put your name in the middle if you have a learning log, then you can type your name in the middle or you can fill it out on paper. And then around the, the, the radius of the circle, there are five different circles. Think about the first five descriptors professionally that come to mind or even personally. What I thought about was what is it that people say about me often? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what helped me to figure out what my five things were. So go ahead, think about yourself for just a few minutes to be able to fill out your circles of identity and then we'll push past in just a minute. And on the learning log, you don't actually type in the circles. There's just a little, there's a, a row underneath the graphic for you to type your responses in if you're working from the learning log. So we started with just the circles of identity. We started with just your professional, like how do you show up at work? How do you show up in the world? Um, and now we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about our strengths and skills and also areas that are not strengths for us. 
So in addition to me not being shy, love being, love having a microphone and being on the stage, being a leader, being task oriented, being an introvert and being a creator, some very specific skills that I have, uh, my Gallup strengths are act achiever, activator, learner, and command, um, restorative and command, excuse me. And um, I have a strong skill set in developing and creating products and plans. Um, I am aligned with my creator um, identity, have a very creative eye, um, and I am typically a very strong public speaker and writer. These are some of my strengths and skills, but what I am not good at is managing time and prioritizing. I am not good at editing and proofreading my own work or anyone else's. I'm not good at individual small one-on-one um, -on -one connections. I'm not relational in that regard. I'm really not good at sales and marketing, which is terrible for a small business owner. And honestly, as much as I, as hard as I try, listening does not come naturally for me. I have a hard time listening and hearing other people's perspectives. Thank you for sharing, Cheryl. This is very therapeutic. Okay. So on the right are the things that I mentioned already, the things that, that came to mind as I described myself. I have some other strengths, I guess, on the list left there. This is mildly uncomfortable to talk about your strengths and weaknesses out in public, but hopefully you're writing some great things down. So I like synthesis and analysis. So I'm really good at seeing big picture, making it apply to small and my, so going from macro to micro. I like to research. I like coalition building. So I'm always getting all my friends together to go do something or go do this or go do that. I like to also do that professionally with connecting nonprofits to for profits, et cetera. I like coaching. I'm very independent. So um, I, I like to work alone, but I also like relationship building. I know contradiction. And then I'm not good at working without structure. So if you leave me in a vacuum without structure, I'm going to create structure. That's just my first instinct. I'm not good at complete, completing long-term tasks. I started five books in 2021, 2020, and they're not finished yet. I'm working on it. And then I'm not also good at direct marketing, which makes it hard for me to be Charlotte's partner because neither one of us is good at. We're working on it. We're going to get a consultant there. And then I'm not good at managing adults. I don't like grown up problems, but I love children. So those are the things that I am not good at and the things that I am good at. So now it's your turn. So hopefully you've come up with your five things. If not, we don't mean to assign homework, but I am a teacher, so it does come very naturally, but you can finish later if you need to. And then now we would love for you to add some of your strengths and skills. And then I think just as importantly, what are you not good at? Because understanding what we don't want is just as important as understanding as what, what we do want. So I'll give you a few seconds to process that. Dr. Scott Dunmore commented in the um, chat that we compliment each other. And in so many ways, like we, <laughs> we compliment each other personally and also professionally, you know, and it's, it's crazy because um, I can't imagine the work that we do. You know, right now we have five clients, five schools that we're working with, um, schools and organizations and um, I, it never fails. I'm like, Tony, did you do such and such? She's like, yep, did that. Cause I completely forgot about it. Um, or there is the very, the, the minutia of the work. And, um, we just pick up, it's almost like, you know, we pick up where each other would have left off. Um, and so, yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Typically we work best as people, as individuals, when we are working from our strengths. So it is really important that we know what those strengths are. Um, 
But it's also important to know what we're not good at. Like, I know that I'm not good at connecting with people. So when we get a sales lead through our website, I am not the person to call them because my answer, my question is going to be, what do you want us to do for you? Tony takes time to build relationship, to build trust, to get to know who they are, to get to understand that their needs. Um, I pick up the phone. I'm like, hey, here are our five products that we offer. Which one do you want? And when do you want to start? So knowing what we're not good at and understanding how we can um, develop a strong strategy or a system to overcome that because the not good at don't mean you don't do it right. it just means you have to find a way to overcome it I'm amazed I'm an amazing writer but I'm terrible at proofreading I'm also very impatient therefore when I write a blog or when I write an article guess what I want to do publish it right then but I have to learn to balance that patient that urgency with patience right so I have to stop and pause and I have a list of people that I run it by um, because otherwise my stuff would be all out there looking a hot mess and then people would not trust my expertise because of things like typos and misspellings and so um, understanding what your strengths are what your skill set is and what you're not good at is critical in figuring out what opportunities lie ahead for you um, in leveraging your doctoral research and your work. So we've done the first question. We just walked through who you are. Hopefully you have a clear picture. I mean, and we all know who we are as people, but sometimes it's very, um, enlightening and it's very, um, uh, to just sit down and think about it in terms of a very specific um, purpose. And so tonight the purpose is discovering your next steps um, to utilize your doctoral degree. So who are you? What are some things that you enjoy? What are, what, how do you show up in the world, right? The second question, I'm sorry, number seven is like, what is your dream job? What is your role? What's the thing that you would do if no one paid you, but you'd wake up every single day and you'd do it? I used to think that my dream job was to be a principal. And so <laughs> Sorry, that's funny now, Cheryl. It's funny now, right? <laughs> so I spent all of my, my entire career preparing for that role. That was my thing because I love students, because I love learning, because I, but there was so much about the principalship that was not aligned to all those things we just talked about. I don't like talking to people that much. I don't mind a couple of kids in my office, but engaging all day long with students, with teachers, with adults was absolutely draining for me. Um, so what is the thing that you would do for no money? Um, and so for me, that is training adults, right? That is inspiring passion and inspiring people to find their strengths and um, to find a place of passion and to work from that. Um, I love, I, we are educators at heart. Um, Tony and I are both master educators um, in our respective districts. And so um, we also, I, my dream role is teaching teachers to be better teachers um, and teaching leaders to lead the work of excellence in education. So that's the thing that I would do. If I, if I could wake up every day and wasn't gonna get a paycheck, I would still wanna teach people how to be better teachers and teach leaders how to lead for excellence and equity. So, have y'all heard of Brene Brown? She's my like model, right? So I, I wanna be the next black Brene Brown in the making. So I want to write books and travel and give keynote speeches and just generally connect with people on a broader scale across the world. I know that sounds kind of grandiose, but I mean it across the world um, about education and equity. And so, Super excited. Charlotte and I just got our first keynote. We landed that. So no, my dream is come. We did the we did the high school last year. Okay, our second <laughs> keynote. And so um I'm super excited about living my dream. It's actually starting to happen. So very excited about watching what God is doing. And just stopping and taking the time to dream is important. So what is your dream job? If you could do anything. What would that be? So take some time to write that. And while you're writing that, we're gonna go on to question eight. Um, and we'll just start to share while you're working there. And I just said, you know, I thought my dream role was being a principal. And if there's one thing I never, ever, ever wanna do again is be a principal. I want to serve principals, I want to serve schools, but I don't ever, ever, 
want to be a principal again. When, so, when Charlotte, when, when would you be a principal again? Never, ever, <laughs> never do I want to be a principal. <laughs> Zero like, stars. Dr. Everett, we, I'm so glad you made that statement. We're going to talk about that in a little bit um, when we get to the end. Yeah, zero stars. Do not recommend the principalship. Not for people like me. It, it is very well aligned to my research, to my work, right? Mm -hmm. But not aligned to my personality and my interests and the way I show up in the world. What about so, you, Tom? Yes, I don't ever want to manage people, grown people. I don't have a grown people ministry. I, I, I like children. I like students. I like project management, mm -hmm. but not people. And so I, I discovered that by managing people, right? Sometimes you do, you go get to your dream and it's like, oh, this is not exactly what I thought it would be. So that's the thing that I don't want to ever do again. All right. Number nine, who are some people, um, the types of roles, the type in specific individuals that trust you? and why. So for me, teachers trust me. Teachers trust me um, in every school where I've been a school leader because I'm present, because I show up, um, because I'm in their classrooms, because I give them critical and helpful feedback, because I try to be responsive. I don't like any of that, but I do it and I'm really good at it. Um, but teachers trust me. Principals trust me. Principals trust me because I have done the work that they are doing. Um, People in education adjacent organizations trust me because I have nonprofit leadership experience because they are um, um, nonprofits are typically mission oriented and because I am mission oriented. I do while I don't necessarily like the personal work, I do like the project work. Remember, I'm task oriented and I'm mission oriented. So I do like connecting with people, connecting to a mission, to a purpose. So these are the kinds of people that trust me. Teachers trust me, leaders, school leaders trust me, um, leaders in education spaces trust me, parents trust me because I do a really, I, I try really, really hard to always be on the side of parents because I think it's important that I never alienate them um, in the work that we do in schools for their students. So again, Charlotte and I are very opposite here. I think that um, number 10 is who might not trust you and why. Uh, principals, would not have any reason to trust me. This is not my arena. I do not claim to be an educational leader. I am a classroom leader. I'm a teacher leader, but I have no clue about budgets and all the things that principals do, and I never have wanted to. And so that's not who trusts me. But what I realized is that the people who trust me, the people who I could call right now and say, hey, do you have contract roles or whatever, are all in STEM education. So people who are in the educational STEM, STEM realm, I have a pretty good catalog of folks to choose from. Now that doesn't help now that I've switched gears to DEI, right? But that means that I just have to build new connections. And then sometimes I get to dabble in both. So there is this trust built over the years and with, through expertise. And then I also have this group of people who may not trust me that I have to work a little bit harder to make connections with. And so once again, just like in question five or in question six, or we were looking at what are you good at and what are you not good at? Just because somebody might not trust you now does not mean that they are not a potential um, target for your mm -hmm. work. It means that you just got to stop and think. Remember, peanut butter and jelly. What did you call us? Um, we are um, cake and ice cream. So um, when Tony makes that initial call to a school or to a principal, one of the first things she does is says, Charlotte's a principal. Right. <laughs> Charlotte's, and she really... <laughs> She, she uses that, she leverages my role to build trust with them and then talks about how her role as a teacher helps build trust with the people because teachers hate professional development because typically it's terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it's typically, off, it's often given by people who aren't close or maybe only tangentially uh, related to, uh, connected to education. So who we are um, helps with that trust building. We have to be very um, nuanced in how we how we approach people who might not normally trust us um, to build that critical relationship for our business model. 
And we're talking about trust because trust is the point of conversion for usage and yes. people buying or listening to you. So we've learned that through our marketing research that building trust is really, really important. And thinking about who you already have that foundation of trust laid with, starting there, building from there, branching from there, just gives kind of maybe a different perspective on how to think about what contacts to to start with once you're you're launching out into a different branch of your career. So thematic examination of who we are. It's not often, I'm, at least for me, that I sit back and think, what are recurring themes in my life? What are the things that have been repetitive, things that I'm still passionate about, passionate about now that I might have been passionate about as a child? things that are still threads that are still running through my professional career. And so for Charlotte and I, we both love kids. Charlotte got me my very first job working with kids at Tender Loving Care Preschool in 1996. And that changed my life. Two-year-olds, I fell in love with them, changed my, my major to child development, and I've been with kids ever since. So we both are passionate about kids and loving them we both love well, making hold on oh. hold on hold oh, on no, no i don't love not. kids like that my bad i love working and advocating for kids i, I want to be around kids my kids right. are grown so my kids my kid phase is over so you like to Sorry. be around them i like to I work do. for them just a the point of clarity just a point That's of clarity that okay. is facts. And I am still a teacher because I love to be in the classroom. I, mm -hmm. I love being with students. Charlotte does not. Yes. Okay. Sorry. The next bullet, we both love making learning relevant and fun. Is that true, Charlotte? That's true. That right? is very true. Okay. For, both adult, for adults and children. <laughs> for both. Yeah. And then we're both hams. So we're living our dream right now, being in front of people, getting to talk, getting to share our story. We love that. And we also love to be creative. Okay. So we like mm -hmm. to think creatively for recreation. We like to just come up with stuff. What if this? What if that? So we have great imaginations and we're both dreamers. So think about your life. What have you always been passionate about? And it might be time to get back to that first love. Mm -hmm. What have you always received compliments or doing? What are those things that even as a child or even as recently as, you know, this week, last week, what have people said that you're good at? And then what would you do, as Charlotte has mentioned before, every day for no money or recognition? So add that information to your notes and your learning log. So we shared earlier that we have this long journey, right? And we, we, we're, I mean, I know we look 20, but you know, we're well into our forties and we've spent the past 20 years, our entire career um, in some, in education, close to education, working with students, working for students. Um, and it's really simple. It comes down to a couple of things. What you're good at, what you're passionate about is what you can do. So I love, I've already shared, I love being on the stage and I love kids. So guess what I get to do almost every day? I get to be on a stage in front of people, telling them, teaching them, inspiring them to do better work for students, to do their best work for students. Um, Tony shared, like we, when, we, when she says living our dream, like really living our dream. Um, we get to work with schools and educators from across the country. Um, we get to go, we're one of the school, and it started y'all with this one little $29 workshop that we did with another guy, um, uh, uh, one of our colleagues. And from there, like we just looked up one day and we had so much fun and we were like, let's do it again. And then we had fun doing it again and we did it again. And next thing we know, um, we have honestly launched an entire, um, an entire business that's centered in our passion, that's centered in our purpose and that's centered in the things that bring us joy. So, so some practical suggestions. So we've talked very kind of 
macro to micro. So we talked very much about big picture, who you are, that kind of thing. Now we'll drill down to some practical suggestions, things that you could possibly try. So if you're like me and Charlotte and you like to write, here are some just suggestions. Now, um, Edutopia is one of the premier education um, websites. So if education is not your, your discipline, your field of study, then find some that are, and don't be afraid to put something out there. So this year I got to write for Edutopia, praise the mm -hmm. Lord, one of my dreams come true. Um, and it was, it was special uh, process, but getting out there and trying. We also just started our own blog. So we, if we wanted to publish something right now, we could. So write, write, and then write some more. If that's your interest, get it out there, find Facebook groups to share it in and just put it out there. Get our And let me say when you, and here's the deal, like we did all that work in the beginning about, you know, who are you? What's important to you? What are your passions? Write about that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. My very first blog that I wrote, has 6,000 readers because it was something I was passionate about because and Tony, as she was editing it, I remember her saying, but Charlotte, don't say that, say this, because this is the way you really speak. Like I was so used to scholarly writing in the, you know, because it was fresh, mm -hmm. off, fresh off a dissertation that I was writing like a scholar. I wasn't writing as a human being. I wasn't writing as somebody who was just trying to inspire and, and, and have positive impact. And once I shifted back from scholarly writing to personal writing, um, the impact has just been enormous. So think about all those things we talked about earlier. And if you want to blog, blog from your heart, even if it's about your discipline, even if it's about mm. your research, talk about why it matters to you. Talk about how you hope it changes the world. Talk about all the all the ways that it changed you. Um, so write from your heart, um, at, in addition to any opportunities to produce uh, scholarly and um, technical writing. And then teach. Yep. So I'm developing a course right now. I did Tony. I did two modules today. Hey, that's so okay. Hey. Yeah. doing a module right now um, on the R word on um, helping people to develop the skills, strategies and stamina for healthy dialogue about race. Um, so you can you can create courses, you can develop training that can be presented um, within your discipline, within your industry. You can consult with others and teach them how to refine their processes or their products. You can tutor other doctoral students or other people that are in your discipline. You can create a YouTube channel to uh, disseminate information um, and instruction in a particular area or um, in a particular area or topic. And for training and consulting, our favorite uh, mentor in that realm says, her name is Erica Jordan Thomas, and she talks about how you already know your first client. Yes. So it's always somebody who you've already built that trust with, who is willing to take a chance on you. So leap out there and do it. Speaking. So conference presentations are a low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Definitely the the application to be able to do this talk with you today was a page it was less than a page of writing that we had to do to be able to present to people who are in our in our field and in our realm so get out there do conference presentations podcasts all those stuff are, all those things are are free at this point you can easily create and publish and keynotes just like we talked about before you probably already know someone who would value having you stand up and talk to their group and pay you for it. So get out there and speak. And providing a service. Can you write for someone? Can you edit for someone? Can you create content for someone? And I want to go back to um, Dr. Everett's earlier comment. He said, oh my gosh, like I would pay you to do, he asked who does our graphics work? And I said, I do, I am not a graphic designer. However, you might not be a graphic designer either, um, but if you um, have a, a gig, a, a job that you love and you're just looking for additional ways to leverage your expertise um, and you are super creative, you can do content design for someone else in your industry or in your discipline. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I 
create websites. I have a, two new clients right now, um, Dr. Altheria Caldera at um, Howard University and Vicki, uh, well, y- y'all don't know Vicki, but anyway, you don't know Altheria either, but anyway. Um, but because they're educators and because they're in the education space, they want me to create their work, their websites for them and do their graphics packages because they don't have to translate for me because all they have to do is give me, you know, some bullets and some key points and I can flesh that thing out. I can speak their soul for them. And then all they have to do is edit and you know and refine and revive refine and revise um <laughs> great i'm looking forward to it so there are some things that you so even though my doc my doctorate is not in graphic design i am not a graphic designer but it's a skill that i have and when i take that skill and a passion something i really enjoy okay. and i utilize and i take my doctoral my doctoral research and my professional expertise and I merge those two I now have a whole new niche that I can tap into to um, maximize my impact out in the world so what service can you provide can you do project management can you write standard operating procedures can you write training if a company or an organization is without a leader could you be a contracted interim leader what are all the different services that you could provide remember we've already thought through who wants your service who trusts you what is what do you know what do you not know what are you good at so we're going to in just a minute going to narrow even all of that down into coming up with a list of things that you can do as your very next steps um, to leverage your degree outside of academia. You also may just want to get a new job. So there are lots of companies out there that are supporting the things that we are passionate about. Mm-hmm. Maybe, that, maybe that's the next move is finding a, a company that will pay you what you're worth, a company that already is aligned with your passion. So making sure that we really examine the fruit of these companies? What is it that they have created in the community or created in your field? And making sure that you align yourself with a place that makes good sense for who you are and who you want to be. So what we are learning in our time this last year after our doctoral journey is that it it could also be a cocktail of all this. Mm -hmm. So we both have had full-time jobs. We've both done all of these things part-time. We're Charlotte's transitioning now to full-time consulting, maybe full-time teaching at university, who knows, but whatever it is, follow your passion and be out there experimenting. That's the thing that we've learned is just to get out there and try and see what happens. So three key truths. Number one, the reality is your work and your research matter to someone somewhere. And we found that out on social media, on a a simple Mm -hmm. Facebook post. Someone Mm -hmm. said, does anybody know? And Tony and I looked at each other and was like, well, we know. That's what we do. (laughs) So your work and your research matter to someone somewhere. Number two, the second key truth is you can create endless opportunities to share your work and your impact. And y'all have all heard the statement where if they don't invite you to the table, build your own table. So we have created opportunities to share our work and our impact within the education space and in society at large. And number three, your best work and your greatest impact happen when you are operating from a place of joy. And joy happens when you're working with your strengths and operating in your passions. So you might not be be ready to launch out and like start a whole consulting firm. You might be still working a nine to five and that nine to five pays the pays the bills and 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 but then that five to nine is where you get your is where you get your fulfillment is where you get your joy and where you're creating these opportunities for yourself and for society later. We invite you to just drop any questions that you might have in the chat. We have about a minute left, so we're going to wrap it up, but we would love to continue interfacing interfacing with you. So feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat. And I am so excited that we had this hour together to start to rewrite our story. Mm -hmm. It definitely feels possible to me that we can make different choices, that we can create our own space in whatever area um, that we focus in. And our story is just beginning. So completing a doctorate or attending a doctoral program is only the start of our journey to greatness. And so we are glad that we got to participate and support you as you continue your journey. So on a scale of 10, on your way out, before you leave, one, 
I, I don't know. I'm still scared. I don't think I can do anything with this. I just wrote these 212 pages for nothing. Or 10, you are absolutely ready to jump out and, live and, and get yourself out there and share your greatness and share your expertise and change the world. Where are you? Just drop your answer to that in the chat. Great. Hey, come on, 10. We got some 10. Turn up. Yes. Yes. Good. We are, if you were able to access the learning log, um, all of our social media handles are linked on the last page of the learning log. Our email addresses are there. And we would love to be your partners and cheerleaders as you take your next steps, whatever it is that um, your next step is. If you just want a thought partner, mm -hmm. please reach out to us because this has been the journey of a lifetime for us. And as Tony said, I'm transitioning out. I hate being a principal. I'm transitioning out of full-time principalship. Um, and who knew? I did not know the world that was available to me. And I also had no idea that I could create it for myself. So um, we are standing behind you. We are cheering you on. Um, if there's anything that we can share with you, about our journey, um, share any other learnings with you, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Also, um, if you would like to connect with us, all like I said, all of our social media handles are there and we would uh, love to continue this relationship that we've built tonight in this first hour. Please share your evaluation information on the way out. So I know that the evaluation was placed in the chat earlier. Please let us know how you we did, what you think. Thanks for having us tonight. All right, Dr. Dunmore, we're all Dr. Scott Dunmore, we're done. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Horton Williams and Dr. Harrison <laughs> Kelly. My, 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 where do we start all over again to reevaluate ourselves and also to just leverage these degrees and the degrees to come uh, for maximum impact? because we definitely have a wide, wide world in which we can definitely utilize them. So again, as I started off, ice cream and cake, Oprah and Gail, Rick and Frack, day and night, the Frack. epitome, the epitome of best friends forever. Mm -hmm. And also let me go here, macaroni and cheese. Hey. You both have such a passion for education love for children, helping others, sharing and caring, lifting confidence as everyone climbs around you or try to climb. And also you have definitely told us in so many words with this hour and through all of your actions, your experiences, your educational uh, background too as well, that my favorite saying that the tassel was definitely worth the hassle mm. and i know all of us that have crossed that ridge and river before and those of us that are almost there definitely know that the tassel is indeed worth the hassle i want to thank everyone for being on this wonderful workshop number one of a series of workshops and the last workshop will be held on november the second and just as Dr. Horton Williams and Dr. Harrison Kelly said that they can be reached through social media platforms too as well. Of course, that's probably how some of you found out about us on social media platforms too as well for the Black Doctorial Network. And we're on all platforms. And also I would like to let you know that the next workshop will be held on September the 21st. It will however be at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and the title of that is The Benefits of Diversity in the Workplace. Now, of course, we don't only have workshop series. We have so many things that we do in the Black Doctorial Network in order to help everyone. But we have a virtual graduate school and career fail, fair, excuse me, that is October the 14th, 2021 from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then the creme de la creme is our eighth annual Black Doctoria Network virtual conference, which will be held October the 29th through the 31st. And it's from nine to six. We will have maybe some lunch and learns. We have some keynote speakers every day. And we're even thinking about having an evening keynote speaker. 
and we're doing STEM, we're doing business, we're doing health, we're doing diversity and inclusion. So please, please consider to register for our eighth annual Black Doctoria Network. And of course, membership has its privileges. So of course, if you join, then the prices will be not the same as everyone else who is not a member to as well. We also have our ongoing um, things in social media that's also out um, for everybody to see. Conversation starters, where we have various topics given to us by doctoral candidates, as well as doctoral scholars. And also we have Doctors Talk podcasts. And sometimes we just wanna talk about where we've been, where we want to go, kind of similar to what Dr. Horton Williams and Dr. Harrison Kelly brought to us tonight. And then also what we're passionate about. So definitely consider to continue to ride that road with us on the Black Doctoria Network. So I only had one question and I think that probably Dr. Everett will reach out to all of to you um, probably one-on-one. -on -one. And his question was that um, he was trying to get his consultancy off the ground. Um, it's called Alpha Management LLC. And he wants to develop the visual branding and websites. Those are his challenges, Dr. Horton Williams mm -hmm. and Dr. Harrison Kelly. And he wanted to know what you suggest. So I'm quite sure that you can have that very intimate talk with him. Oh, yeah at his leisure and at your leisure. But would you like to address anything right quick? I connected with him via a direct message. So yeah, we're gonna get some, we're gonna partner and get, get him launched, get him looking good on yes. the web, yes. Great, <laughs> that's great. And he said, amen. <laughs> so again, thank you everybody. For, enjoy, uh, for being with us tonight and for joining us. And we'll look for you at all of the other um, series of workshops that are upcoming, which will also commence with our eighth annual um, Black Doctoria Network virtual conference. And like last year, it was supposed to be based um, in Atlanta. So of course, Atlanta will be welcoming us again this year too as well. So we'll have some speakers and also some um, doctoral scholars, some keynote speakers, as well as um, other uh, research poster, um, presenters too as well from the Atlanta area and from all over the world. We even have some from Malaysia. So definitely um, you will really, really like it. So we hope to see you. So right now I'm going to um, wish you all a good evening and thank you again for joining the first workshop of our Black Doctoria Network series. Good evening and thank you.